just about that time now. So I guess, you know, we'll get started. Um, so Eileen, yeah. we're really looking forward to your update. And so uh, it's Owen Roberts here. Eileen, can you also, um, uh, for the people on the phone and others who are new, just a little introduction and background about uh, yourself, uh, the work you've done uh, on the C4, so that we can um, uh, make sure that everyone has, is at the same kind of level. Okay, sure. And um, and I also wasn't sure how much uh, background everybody already had about FOP, and I do have some uh, just, uh, basic introductory slides. And so as I um, go through those, if you if everybody knows this and just want me to skip all, all of this, just let, let me know. Or if you have questions as I go along, please um, don't, you know, please stop me, ask, ask questions. Okay? I mean, all, I mean, all the time is yours. So, I mean, it would be nice to really go to the background for everybody's comfort, I think. That's okay, great. So, um, um, as I guess everybody knows, I'm um, Eileen Shore. Um, I'm here with a, um, uh, a senior investigator in my lab, uh, Celine Chakalakal, who um, is the person who um, uh, does and coordinates um, most of the um, in vivo drug, drug testing studies that we do in our lab. And so he's, he's joining us today um, in case some really hard questions come up that I can't answer. Um, so uh, I have been uh, working on um, FOP, which is a uh, rare uh, genetic disease of uh, heterotopic or extraskeletal bone formation uh, for, I, I stopped counting after 25 years, but um, I've been working in this field for, um, for, for quite a while. Um, um, our research group, um, initially identified the mutations or that the ACVR1 gene was um, uh, mutated um, in this uh, disease and we have uh, continued to uh, try to understand um, what this mutation is doing to uh, cells and to tissues in order to promote the formation of bone. Um, um, so I'll just go ahead and um, and and dive in with uh, uh, the presentation, um, which, which will tell you, I guess, as much about um, sort of background and some of the things that that we've done. But um, um, you're all aware that uh, ACVR1 is also known as ALK2. It's a BMP uh, type one receptor. Um, uh, despite the name of uh, bone morphogenetic protein, um, uh, some people are have started calling it body morphogenetic protein because it really has a lot of important um, roles in um, uh, virtually all, all tissues, many different uh, cell types, and, and has a range of uh, functions through development and, um, and tissue maintenance. Um, uh, you're very closely um, aware of the mutations in uh, ACBR1 uh, associated with, uh, with DIPG, and uh, those, there's a, a clear overlap of, uh, of mutations that um, occur in DIPG as well as, uh, as FOP. Um, and um, all of, and I'll show a little, little bit of, of data in a, in a bit, but um, all of the mutations um, uh, appear to be activating mutations uh, that increase signaling of the uh, BMP pathway. Uh, so um, the goal of, of the study that we have done is to look at the efficacy of uh, uh, M4K2009. Um, um, and again, you know, you can speak more about um, this compound and, and the details of, of this compound um, better than I. Uh, but um, uh, our sort of mission or our, our goal was to um, uh, test how efficiently uh, this drug could block um, uh, ACVR1-induced heterotopic ossification. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the mouse model a little bit more in a minute. Um, and I just wanted to introduce you to uh, heterotopic ossification. Um, it is um, 
in a, a fairly simple description, it just means the presence of bone where bone is not normally present. So basically, uh, heterotopic bone or bone forming outside of the skeleton. Uh, and I, I do want to point out that um, the bone that forms in um, uh, conditions of heterotopic ossification are, are bone tissue. It's not just um, calcification or, or mineral deposits. It's actually a process that forms uh, a tissue. It involves a cell differentiation and the bone formation um, uh, in different circumstances or um, prompted by different types of mutation uh, can occur by um, uh, the two basic uh, pathways that uh, skeletal bone forms, uh, endochondral or intramembranous. Endochondral uh, ossification goes through a cartilage intermediate, that's how most of our long bones form, uh, and intramembranous ossification is a, di a direct differentiation into uh, osteoblasts or the bone forming cells, and that, for example, is the way our skull forms. So, um, so this disease, um, heterotopic ossification, or at least, well, in, in general, heterotopic ossification isn't a disease of, uh, I'd say, bone formation per se. It's the induction of the process uh, to uh, trigger bone formation. Uh, so uh, FOP, as I mentioned, is a very uh, rare um, uh, genetic condition. Um, uh, clinically, uh, it is um, uh, diagnosed by, um, uh, by the, um, can, can you see my cursor? I guess so. Um, by um, fairly uh, yeah. characteristic uh, toe malformations. So there are uh, clear uh, effects on uh, skeletal uh, development. Uh, but uh, clinically, it's this uh, progressive uh, bone formation um, uh, that is the um, uh, biggest clinical effect of the disease. Um, the bone formation uh, does not form prior to birth, but sometime after birth, it begins to form. It can uh, occur uh, spontaneously without warning. Uh, generally, episodes um, in children who have the underlying mutation, um, bone formation episodes, uh, almost always have begun by the age of five, but can occur uh, much uh, at much younger ages. We've seen children uh, within their first month of life who begin to uh, form bone. Uh, injury? Uh, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, how reversible is it? Is it better to prevent the whole onset of the process or if bone is already formed, how easily is it to reverse that process? Uh, yeah, so, so right now there is no treatment for this disease. There are uh, uh, clinical trials that uh, have been going on and are being in initiated, but right now there, there is no way to do either, to either stop the bone or uh, to remove the bone. So uh, ideally a, a treatment uh, would be to completely prevent the bone from uh, starting in the first place. Uh, with, with FOP, uh, because of the underlying uh, mutation um, and because the topic bone is triggered by injury, uh, surgery to remove the bone uh, has been found in almost every case that I'm aware of to just stimulate more um, formation of bone uh, subsequent mm. to the surgery. Uh, there are, and I, I didn't discuss this, but uh, heterotopic bone is actually a, a fairly, uh, it's not such an unusual um, um, condition or, or complication, um, at least um, uh, on, on some level, certainly not the, to, usually not to the extent that you see in patients with FOP, but um, uh, people who have hip replacement surgeries, it's not unusual for some heterotopic bone to form um, at the surgical site. Um, certain types of high impact uh, wounds, uh, blast injuries, uh, car accidents, head and neck trauma, um, all of these conditions um, have been associated with uh, a, a not so unusual occurrence of, of heterotopic bone. And in these, what we refer to as trauma-induced or non-genetic forms 
um, those uh, once the bone matures. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's a single episode, the bone matures, and in many cases, that bone can be surgically removed. Uh, but in FFP, you always have the stimulus to form uh, new bone, and so that really is not a good option. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, um, you can see that um, this is a pretty uh, devastating and extensive disease, uh, the skeleton that I'm showing. If any of you have a chance to visit uh, me in Philadelphia, there is a, um, a small museum at the College of Physicians in, um, in Center City, Philadelphia, where uh, the skeleton is housed. Uh, it belongs to a man who um, lived in, uh, in Philadelphia and requested that his skeleton be uh, preserved. But you can see how, how extensive the bone has, um, uh, has become. It basically you know, has, has coated a lot of his normal skeletal bone. It has uh, filled, uh, in some cases, basically entire uh, muscle compartments. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, devastating disease. Um, so um, uh, every patient that we have um, examined for a mutation, uh, we have found a heterozygous mutation in the uh, ACVR1 gene. Um, almost all of the FOP patients have the same single nucleotide substitution. So um, uh, the man that you saw on the previous slide, he had one, one, oops, uh, one single nucleotide change uh, was sufficient to, um, to cause the, oh, goodness, that's my mouse, sorry. Um, um, Boy, I don't. My, as soon as I touch my my mouse to use the cursor, it jumps. Um, so I'm going to try not to use my uh, my mouse. Um, so um, uh, so this is a little bit different than um, uh, from DIPG. Um, uh, like I said, in in FOP, almost everybody has uh, the same mutation. Um, in our patient series. Um, the last time I counted, it was about 97% of the patients that we had, um, had analyzed. Um, there are um, uh, other uh, mutations, um, um, and I'll talk about those in, in a while. Uh, but um, here I just wanted to, uh, again, il- illustrate, um, I don't know why this is so sensitive. Uh, I'm going to give up. Um, uh, so uh, again, I, I think most of you are familiar with the signaling pathway. Um, the mutation, um, this common mutation in FOP occurs in the um, uh, GS domain, the glycine serine um, domain, just inside um, to the uh, inner side of um, uh, the cellular uh, membrane. This is a region, a functionally important uh, region of uh, the receptor um, in terms of um, conferring downstream uh, signaling. Um, the uh, signaling that occurs by this mutation um, is um, our, our data have consistently supported that um, that leaky signaling, so in the absence of um, any uh, ligand, the mutant receptor has activity. So it seems to be um, on, always on, always signaling, but at a very, very low level. In response to ligand, it's hyper-responsive. So compared to uh, a wild-type receptor, uh, we get enhanced signaling. So uh, when, we th- when I think about or how um, this mutation is affecting cells and uh, tissues, um, it could be um, sort of by two potential modes or, or combinations of, of those modes. So signaling when it's entirely inappropriate to be signaling in the pathway should be completely shut off or an enhanced um, uh, response to a, um, a normal um, uh, uh, induction of the pathway. Um, so, um, 
as I've mentioned, uh, most patients with FOP have the R206H mutation, and this is the one that um, we have studied in, in our lab um, uh, most, but um, um, other patients, and again, in, in patients, um, these, what we refer to as variant mutations um, that occur both in the as well as the DNA uh, seeding um, uh, have been identified. And I think with the exception of maybe uh, one variant that's been found in DIPG uh, that has not been found in FOP, uh, there seems to be a, uh, a pretty complete overlap um, between uh, the, the mutations. And you know why that is, that is, we certainly can, can talk about that or, or, or speculate about that. Um, you know, I, I suspect that um, uh, most mutations uh, may be too severe uh, for cell survival. And, um, um, and, and these are the ones that we happen to be able to see. Uh, and just uh, quickly, um, I thought I'd show you some um, uh, data. This was uh, published a few months ago um, where we have um, uh, run some uh, signaling assays to look at um, uh, some of the variant mutations in comparison to R206H. And we see that in general, all of the mutations have a fairly similar response um, uh, where there is um, um, a, res uh, a, a ligand um, uh, response as, as well as a ligand uh, independent uh, response. Um, in our hands, we see this um, uh, in um, a, a ligand induced response um, uh, to various ligands. So we have mostly looked at uh, BMP ligands like BMP4. Um, Actin A has gotten a lot of attention over the last few years, and, and we see that uh, response at, at, um, as well. Um, though, unlike uh, what some of the data have been reported for. Um, for activin A as uh, not uh, stimulating uh, uh, wild type, um, we, we generally do see that, um, um, that effect on uh, a wild type receptor as well. Um, and then just one more piece of, of data that I um, uh, thought I would point out um, for uh, some of these var variant mutations is, um, you know, in, in general, um, I would suspect that a drug that was uh, effective generally for, uh, for ALK2 or for the, the signaling pathway, if it's going to uh, work to suppress signaling from one of the mutations, I would expect it to be effective um, uh, for the others. Um, there, in most of the assays that we have done, um, they're very similar. Uh, responses. It's a little bit difficult to compare magnitudes of responses just because of uh, sort of technical uh, reasons. Uh, but um, this this experiment was one of the uh, was was the one that pointed out that there there could be subtle differences. We were uh, interested in this from the point of view of um, in patients with some of these non. Um, uh, codon 206 mutations, uh, some will have more or less severe uh, skeletal uh, defects. And so, you know, wondering how the different mutations might affect uh, development. And uh, this suggests that it may be uh, sensitivity uh, to ligand. So in, in this, um, in this uh, plot, um, there are um, two mutations in, uh, in uh, the lines are in red um, that are codon in this our standard 206 mutation uh, along with uh, one in uh, codon 207. And you can see that the trajectory um, uh, you know, starts out uh, elevated and then um, continues to increase over uh, the dose curve and kind of parallels uh, the blue line that you see, which is a strong uh, constitutively active mutation. Uh, the blue line mutation is something that we've never seen um, uh, viable. It's a, um, it's a lab engineered mutation and, and a very strong signaling mutation. Uh, but we do see that um, 
that these, uh, at least these G GS domain uh, mutations seem to form that parallel track where the more ligand um, uh, that the receptor sees, the more it, resp uh, it responds. And that was a little bit different than um, some of the kinase mutations that are plotted here in, um, in green, where they start elevated, but they seem to um, uh, re reach a plateau. And so um, that may um, uh, be important in terms of, of the dynamics and, you know, in your considerations of uh, what might be happening in DIPG tumors that uh, could be a consideration. So, Hi, Eileen. It's, uh, sorry, Eileen, it's Owen. Um, just a quick question. What was the inhibitor you used for, that, for this experiment? There's no, in this experiment, no inhibitor. So the, these were, um, I, I should have explained a little bit more. Uh, these were um, uh, cell lines that were uh, transfected with the different mutant constructs. And then we just challenged them with increasing um, uh, concentrations of, uh, of BMP ligand and measured their uh, response. So we looked at SMAD phosphorylation as a readout of the signaling pathway. But there was no, okay. no inhibition used in this experiment. Okay, so, I get it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, just a simple dose response curve. Okay, so um, turning a little bit more, I guess, to what you really wanna hear about is, um, uh, the experiments that we did look, looking at inhibitors, um, and I'll just uh, introduce our mouse model. So uh, um, the mouse model that we use is with the R206H mutation. Um, it uh, mimics uh, the features of the human disease of, of FOP um, very, very well in terms of uh, forming a heterotopic ossification. I'm gonna try the mouse again. Um, and this is a, uh, a, a CT scan, a micro CT scan. Uh, the, um, so you can see all the uh, mineralized tissues and the skeleton. In this particular uh, scan, the newer or the more recently formed bone is shown in uh, red. It's just an enhanced color. So you can see these um, extra pieces of bone that have uh, formed around some of the long bones and along the, the spine. Um, and I won't go through the details, but there are several other, you know, more subtle uh, clinical features that we see in FOP and, and we see uh, them all mimicked in the mouse model, um, in, including this um, uh, toe malformation that uh, in patients is uh, more specific for the first digit of the foot. And we see the same thing in the mouse where we see a, a truncation of uh, the first digit of the hind limb and not the forelimb, though uh, we're looking into that a little bit more and there are other defects and other skeletal elements. They're just a little more subtle, uh, both in patients and the mouse model. Um, and um, this uh, model um, uh, responds and forms heterotopic uh, ossification in response to, um, uh, to muscle injury and muscle damage. And so the system uh, that we have developed uses cardiotoxin, which is a commonly used um, uh, uh, toxin to damage muscle. The muscle field uh, uses this uh, quite a bit. And um, you can see here that where there was an in injection of uh, cardiotoxin, heterotopic bone has formed um, a section through that bone. Um, again, this mimics very much what we see in uh, patient histology with areas of bone formation. There usually are areas of, of cartilage nearby and, and fiber proliferative um, areas as well as damaged muscle. So the experimental design um, that uh, we use, um, again, this is, we do, do the experiments in a conditional uh, mouse model because the mouse is uh, embryonic lethal when we uh, express the uh, mutation um, from early stages of, uh, of development. Um, and so um, at about uh, one month of, of age, uh, we will um, put the uh, um, uh, mice on doxycycline chow and that um, activates uh, Cree 
uh, recombinase or induces the expression of uh, Cree recombinase to allow expression of, of the mutation. So um, after five days, um, the, um, the mutation is being uh, wi widely expressed, basically globally ex expressed throughout uh, the mouse. We will do an injection, uh, an intramuscular injection into uh, the mouse hind limb. And then um, allow heterotopic bone to develop over the course of about two weeks and, um, and then conduct um, our evaluation and assays. And this is just to show you, this is uh, an example of uh, day 14. So this is a, a heterotopic bone that has formed in response to an IM injection um, by micro CT. And you can see sort of a, a just on a, a low power view, this is an area of uh, cartilage and bone that's uh, formed and uh, the histology clearly shows us these uh, big round blue cells are, are cartilage. Um, there's bone um, uh, in the neighboring areas. This more sort of pinkish tissue here is, uh, is bone tissue that's formed. So um, we are, uh, we, we've uh, I've started to evaluate um, M M4K um, uh, 2009 um, to inhibit this uh, uh, heterotopic ossification in the mouse model. So the study design that um, we had um, discussed with, uh, with several of, of you is to look at um, a series of doses of, uh, of the drug. Um, we would tr dose for uh, one, a once a day dosing over the course of uh, two weeks. Um, I've told you about the mice. Um, our target is to use uh, eight mice uh, per group. Uh, again, a cardiotoxin induced um, uh, HO um, and analysis, micro CT and histology, and um, also to uh, collect uh, plasma that we will uh, send, to, um, send to you for analysis. So these are uh, plasma samples that are collected um, on the final day after the last dose. Um, and uh, we also harvested the brains from, uh, from the animals. Uh, so the data that I'll show you today is we've uh, tested um, only one concentration of the drug, but we started with the highest uh, dose. Uh, we've conducted the micro CT um, and the histology is still in, uh, in progress. And this just kind of summarizes that and reminds me to point out that um, uh, uh, on the same day that we do the um, Cardiotoxin injury, um, we follow that with the first treatment of, uh, of the drug and then continue that uh, daily for the next two weeks. Uh, so um, I'll these are some of the uh, micro CT scans and it's uh, difficult for us to um, uh, generate, uh, you know, eight, eight controls and, you know, enough mice for eight, eight controls and uh, eight um, uh, uh, drug treated uh, animals in one. So we do them in kind of sets and, you know, go, go with whatever, with whatever we are able to obtain. So in a, a first uh, experimental set, we had uh, three controls and you can see the bone formation, the heterotopic bone here that has uh, formed in, in these animals. And then we had a set of um, five that we treated with the drug. And uh, you can see it's, it's a little bit variable. This one was uh, a little bit disappointing, um, but you can see that there's little to no HO uh, detected in the others. And in a second uh, set of animals with uh, three more controls, so these are just vehicle treated um, mutant mice, you have uh, extensive heterotopic bone um, and minimal bone formation. There's significantly uh, reduced bone formation in the other. Uh, so I have um, those uh, data um, uh, plotted here. Um, the, um, uh, these are the controls, so vehicle treated, um, and these are the, uh, the drug treated animals. So there are a couple of, you know, uh, you know lo lower than we would have expected in the controls, and this is a little, little bit higher, um, uh, but overall the drug um, seems to be 
uh, very effective. And and I think oof, I think these the variability is uh, mostly uh, technical and just you know some sometimes just you know where the cardiotoxin um, goes in in the injection. It's it's hard to get it in exactly uh, the same location um, each time. And uh, this is just the, the data um, uh, plotted together. Um, so the controls versus uh, the vehicle, or the, the vehicle versus the drug tested. So, um, so that's where we are with, with that. I think the, the drug is looking, um, is looking pretty uh, promising. Um, the micro CT uh, images, um, only show us mineralized uh, tissue. And so we are following this up with histology. So um, in our model of um, heterotopic bone, there's a cartilage stage that forms uh, before the bone um, as part of the, the process. Um, and we wouldn't detect that by micro CT, but we can see that in histology. So we will, um, look at that a little bit more to see if that also has been uh, prevented or if what we're looking at is uh, a delay in the, in the ossification. Um, and we do have the, um, the plasma samples uh, that we collected and the, um, and, and the brains that um, we can uh, send to you um, at, whenever you're ready for them. And uh, I, I guess what we, I would like to do next is, you know, answer any questions that you have and uh, hear your thoughts and um, uh, talk about what you think might be the um, next steps to, um, to go forward with. Yep, thank you. That was good. It's exciting. Um, how does, so you have one other compounds before. I mean, how does this compare to some of the other compounds or other mechanisms you have looked at? Yeah, I mean, Selin and I were talking about that um, uh, as well, and it's it's a little bit difficult to um, uh, to compare. So I I'd say comparable. Um, none of the models that uh, or none of the drugs that we've tested, uh, we have never like pushed the optimization to try to uh, completely shut down uh, the bone formation. Um, I I can you know probably the drug that we've used the most is paliveratine, the drug that is currently in clinical trials for, uh, uh, for FOP. And, uh, but we went through a lot of iterations to uh, optimize dosing. So what we found with paliveratine is that if we dosed at very, very high levels, which I suspect um, if, if the mouse mice could have tolerated it, that it probably would have uh, completely blocked uh, bone formation, but it caused, uh, you know, weight loss in the animals and their hair was falling out. And, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, and the good news was all those effects were, were entirely reversible. Uh, but uh, for paliveratine, we developed a scheme where we do an initial uh, high dose treatment and then we plateau down to a, a lower dose. Uh, we could probably optimize that uh, more to probably uh, figure out you know, exactly how to completely reduce it in the mouse. You know, with your your drug to make a comparison um, again with our sort of best treatment for paliveratine. Paliveratine is probably better, but you know, compared to you know a first. Uh, you know, a, attempt and no optimization of, of conditions or, you know, dosing or, you know, how frequently to, uh, to dose, um, you know, it's, I, I, I wouldn't say that one is better than the other, one is more effective than the other. I just, uh, un until there's more optimization, it, it's difficult to make that comparison. I, I mean, what was the health? It's Owen. What was the health of the mice? Did they lose weight? Did they lose fur? Did they were they agitated? Were they? How did they look? Yeah, they they seemed fine. Um, and let me see. I did. So these are uh, body weights. Um, and tell, tell me, we didn't la label, but the the top, uh, it, the like first half, uh, the group of three at the top. Where the vehicle treated, and then the next five are the drug treated, 
and then in the, the second half again the top three are vehicle, vehicle and the bottom three are um, <laughs> drug treated so you can see um you know o over time um, there's nothing footing there's nothing it, so um it's it it's it does doesn't seem to have an effect we didn't notice a significant difference um the mice seemed fine they seem they seemed healthy uh, so they seemed healthy. There was no uh, lethargy, or they obviously they seem to be eating from those weight numbers. I mean, those weight numbers are really good, actually. Yeah. Uh, they appeared to to me. Uh, was there any other signs? I mean, uh, I I agree. Well, well, I'll give you my take. I'm really pleased with the results. Yep. To be blunt, yep. um, this is an unoptimized dosing. We yep. know that the drug is cleared rather rapidly. So, you know, I know we can't dose, tw it would be very hard to dose twice a day, but as an unoptimized dosing. Right. Um, we, should yeah. able, we should be able to dose it twice daily. Yeah. Well, go, go ahead. Maybe we'll, we'll organize our thoughts about next steps first. How about we start with the comments on this and we'll go to next steps first? Because mm -hmm. I can yep. think of a bunch of things we probably want to do as well. Mm -hmm. um, I had a quick uh, question. Sorry. Sorry, I mm -hmm. wanted to interrupt. Uh, I mean, is it standard to uh, induce the injury and then dose at the same time? Have you done uh, experiments where you've induced the injury and then dosed later? So, so to, be, to be perfectly honest, usually when we start with a new drug, we, we will put the drug on board before the injury. So we really try to stack the deck most of the time. Um, and we did do that in, in this case. Um, it certainly is possible to um, in, induce and then begin to, to treat, but um, you know, for a first test, I, but I think that tells you more about the biology of heterotopic bone and where the sort of most susceptible stage is in the process as opposed to its effectiveness in blocking the, um, the BMP signaling. Does that so make you sense? haven't done you haven't done those types of experiments where you've 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 uh, waited a little bit before dosing. It's typically at the same. You're saying typically it's before. Yeah. Uh, for a new compound, and so this was a, a higher bar, really, in a, That's in right. a way, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. At, at least right. for for a first ex experiment, um, and and again. Um, well, what kind of didn't work? No. Yeah. So again, I think it just depends, like, like I said, to um, the later dosing, um, like I said, t I think tell, tells us more about the biology and the susceptible stages. Um, we, if you thought that that was um, of value to know, we, we, we certainly can do those experiments, but but we generally do not. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I actually, my thing is... Uh, oh, could, you go, could you go closer to my please? Yeah, maybe, man, if no one else has any comments about the results of this, then we, maybe we can talk about next steps. Um, so... Uh, guys, can you guys hear me? Steps? Hello? Hello, yeah, this is Jeff. I just oh, wanted hi, to Jeff. call in. Hi, guys. I just wanted to call in and say uh, thanks uh, to everyone and thanks to Eileen. Uh, you know, I, I can't see the data. I'm actually driving to go pick up my son, but it sounds exciting. Uh, you know, please keep pushing the compound. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jeff. You're having a hard time letting go with this compound, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Enjoy. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. That's good. So let's talk about next steps for a minute. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, the first obvious question is the uh, 50 milligram per kilo. Are you going to do, a, because, you know, it's, it's great result, actually. It's uh, mm -hmm. optimized, and we can see the change already, and the p-value is not very high, but the number is, uh, because, it's, you know, the, the animal number is not very high also. Right now, I would you know like to see a dose response. I mean, I, we can go higher, but I I think if we can go lower and we can see a, a difference, you know, that will also give us comfort that we, what we are seeing is on because we are we are seeing it because of our compound. 
so if you can do a dose response i would that would also give us a lot of comfort um in the in, in the mechanism uh, we are proposing so i think if we even do a 50 mg per kg a lower dose exactly the same thing and then just compare i think that will that will um, and if you can see that no they just did the 100 they were originally yeah. looking for that dose response curve and my initial reaction is that yeah exactly so you know that would be my my first thought um, and then then we can i i'm i'm saying that because you know they, then we can look at the if you do it fairly soon then we can do the uh, you know mass spec analysis of the plasma and brain at the same time that's what i was going at like if you do it within within certain time frame you can ship them all together and we can do the analysis at the same time and it might be nice to do so you could probably do 50 as a lower dose mm -hmm. and then it would be interesting to do 50 twice daily to kind of cover well yeah it, it, first off i i think this the doing the, the 50 and is a to me is a slam dunk yeah. mm -hmm. there would be even a question do you even do the 25 again getting a, a, a better curve yeah depends on the bandwidth and how much it, I mean, I, 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 yeah no exactly uh i am curious about doing twice a day dosing because this drug does seem to clear fast yeah, in my mm -hmm. so um and I am in, and I'm over, I am, this is out for everyone's question and comments. I am quite encouraged by the health of the mice mm -hmm. at 100. So, you know, I'm not sure if you do 50 mix twice a day or, or I know 100, 100 twice, twice a day, a day. <laughs> um, considering the safety of it. Yes. Well, that is, so, hey, this is all. The other reason for that, just, just to land this, is a lot of our other compounds have similar characteristics about clearance. I mean, some of them have better half-life, actually. Some of the backup compounds have better half-life yeah. than 209. And I wouldn't say they have backups yet. Yeah? <laughs> I wouldn't say they just haven't gotten to the front yet. Yeah. Hey, hey, this is Al. My, my take can you, normally is, like... Can you hear me? Cannot do... so, oh, sorry, please. I, sorry, who is that on the line? This is Al. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. could you speak yeah. into the mic, please? Yeah. yeah, I'm trying. I'm in a crowded place. Hey, <laughs> I think the great idea was to go offline and and not spend too much time doing the what ifs remember the whole point of this experiment was to show on target engagement and efficacy dosing i don't care about dosing an animal right if it's if the molecule got in there it hit the target and it had efficacy that's it uh i i think anyway just i'm trying to remember why we why uh eileen was so valuable in doing this experiment is because it eval allowed us to address that very specific question. A narrow spectrum ALK2 inhibitor, does it you know, engage a target and does it inhibit down seed and signaling? We should check obviously with the, with the SMAD signaling. If the answer is yes, is it really worthwhile thinking about all the dosing in a, a mouse? Um, anyway, yeah. just my point. I, I think it very much it is because um, you know, my, the, the first question is a very scientific question. I completely agree with, with it, and it's been, you know, it's, it's a fantastic, you know, that we got the results that we have. Uh -huh. The question, though, is more of a drug development question, is about what are we dosing, how far can we push this, um, what's the safety profile, how does this look in the characteristics, because at some point we have to start making extrapolations yes. about the next steps of what exactly. we're going to be doing. Um, and I know it's nice to take these conversations offline, but I just appreciate the fact that we have so much brain power around the, 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 at any given time that it's mm -hmm. so hard to gather people together for any meeting that while we have it, I like to grab it as best as we can. So those are kind of selfish reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, Al, from the one standpoint, from specifics from the grant, et cetera, we have ticked off a very important box. I don't disagree with, with that comment at all. But we, can, we have the opportunity, I think, to take this further down the drug development path. Actually, there's, there's, there's a very good uh, point. But one of the things, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with Al in, in one point, where because if you're trying to do the safety and the efficacy in the same, we would, it, it will be an ideal scenario. Uh, uh, this is why I propose to do a lower dose. I mean, we know 100 milligram per kilogram once a day is already at, um, at, you know, tolerated in the mice, and it, it looks great. So if you do a 50, and if you see a dose dependence, that is already t telling us that we are seeing the, the you know, changes or the efficacy 
because we are on target, right? So, and then we'll, we'll do the histology is still coming up. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we'll have positive data there also. So this is so I'm, I'm you know we try to always maximize our experiment. We try to do one stone and two bar, right? So we can we can do like 100 milligram per kilogram twice a day and see if the mice will uh, you know tolerate that and we'll see better response and we'll have a, another dose response there. Yeah. But you know, if you if you look at the graph, it's already quite low, the mm -hmm. 100 milligram per kilogram. So if we can see some dose response with 50, that would also give us comfort that we are we are on target. So that's that's how I, I mean for the you know before we go to clinic, we have to do a lot of safety, and that is like it's not going to be in this mouse model. We are going to be doing safety on other you know rodent models, maybe mice, maybe rat, you know, oh those, maybe dogs. Well, so those I are mean, the other. Maybe the question to ask is. Is this the compound we want to move forward with, or do we want to put another molecule in the same experiment? And how how would that compare to O09? Right? I think that's also a valid question. You want to look at well, I, that. That does bring to the fact how much throughput um, can we do with with um, Eileen? Eileen, um, yeah. You know, there there becomes a question. You know. Uh, We'd love to do a lot of compounds in many different doses, and but we have uh, restrictions on time, et cetera. So you know that kind of input and then prioritizing what to do. Uh, you know, without a doubt, we would like to do additional compounds. We have interesting other compounds out there with different half lives. Um, there's a, a lot of reasons to put other ones in there. Having said that, we know a fair bit about 2009. Uh, there's a lot of characteristics that are similar across the class, so we might be able to extrapolate some of the things that we can know from this and going forward. Mm -hmm. So it's a long-winded way to say I'd like to do everything, <laughs> but uh, I need to know I need to know the restrictions we have on this from Eileen. Right, and can Eileen also do BID? That's also another question we should ask, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. the, the twice the twice a day dosing is difficult. We're treating fairly young animals and mm -hmm. using oral gavage. And um, uh, when we have tried this before, you know, I, you know, Celine has gotten bet better and better at uh, doing this. But um, you know, we tend to have more um, leth lethality. You know, sometimes the mice stop eating because their throats are are scratched. So the, the twice a day, unless there was another option for delivering the drug, um, uh, you know, yeah. we, 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 could tr we could try it, you know, twi twice a day for a, sh a short term, but, um, but for, uh, you know, a, a two week experiment and lots of animals and multiple compounds, I mean, that definitely would, would be difficult. How easy to formulate this as an IV? I mean, you would you want to go I even know if it's the same most? Yeah. Well, no, you can do it twice a day. You can do the PK no, side yeah. of it. Yeah, so, so, so Lynn is saying no to IV. Because, yeah, okay. Yeah. Or injected it, yeah, okay. I mean, not like, we do have nice data with, uh, with QD. I don't know that it'd be necessary to do that. And also, if you want to do other molecules, then you're comparing them head to head. That's the key, right? Yeah. Same though. Yeah, so I mean, if you prefer to do one daily dosing, yeah, maybe we pick one. If you're going to compare compounds, just pick a dose and then we compare them at that dose. I think, yeah. And I think the next critical piece of data is going to be getting exposure. But what exposures are we getting those efficacy? Yeah, we don't know what the PK is on this. Hmm? We don't really know much about the PK. Yeah. Yeah, we have the PK for this compound. It's beautiful. We don't know the exposure in this experiment to see if it actually correlates to what we're getting. That's what I'm really saying. So that is coming, right? So we, that's why we started the plasma. Yeah, at, well, the end. We, yeah. Yeah. So at the end, we'll know the exposure. That was the whole idea. And, you know, like, because she already has the compound and this is already running, and mm -hmm. maximizing time-wise, and, 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 you know, we, we had the BID discussion before with Irene, and we, I remember we had the same difficulty, right? So this is why I'm saying that can we easily do this 15 day compound? Or even lower, like 25 milligrams. That might be too high to see to compare compounds. Yeah. The results are pretty, I and mean, you don't see a whole lot of uh, yeah. patients, so it's hard to see if something's better. You can see if something's worse. 
Yeah, it'd be hard to be better, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, hey, could you guys, as Angela, you guys don't have to speak into the mic because people can hear when you're not close. So. Does that work? I'm just wondering if we should go lower if we want to compare compounds because we're already seeing pretty dramatic results. There's not a lot of bone to see. So to see an enhancement either by increased dosing or a better compound, it would be there's not going to be enough signal to see an improvement that's going to need statistical significance. So we kind of kind of find a minimum dose where we can see something and then see if we can get better than that. Exactly. And this is why I'm proposing lower, not higher. Yeah. I'm saying 50 or 25, right? So I think what's going to be good is if we know what kind of exposure levels we are at to see efficacy, then gives us a better hunch to know okay, what kind of levels that we need to see. If we lower the dose, yeah. you know, how much time is lower than the efficacy dose you're seeing now are we below that level? So I think these are the kind of you know, numbers you might need to get at. You know, 100 mix per cake, what kind of exposure are we actually getting to see that level of effect? We will get it, and this is what I'm saying. So time, time effective wise, will, it will be, a, in my opinion, be a much better experiment to do it at 25 or 50. You know, we can discuss it offline and figure out. And then, then see if, if, it, if it is those, uh, we, do you have to do this for them? That will tell a volume um, for this experiment. And then we'll, we'll get the concentration and this technology is coming. So I think this will be a nice package. Uh, all together. And then we can decide going forward if we want to uh, have a better compound, if we can see uh, better response in 25 milligrams per kilogram, then we already know this compound would be better. Mm -hmm. The new compound would be better than the new So the question for Eileen, I mean, so like how many compounds can you handle at any one time? I mean, you can only do them one at a time? Because there's yes. two possible, yeah. set. Yeah. There's two so, possible yeah. strategies. We either do a lower dose, or we actually take a couple more compounds and compare them at the same dose. And then each of those might be a single experiment. So I mean. Right. So, so, so we, we can do bo both or, or either. Um, again, you know, we're a, a small operation, and these are fairly um, time intense uh, experiments. And so, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, we are not able to necessarily, um, well, I, I, I know we're not going to be able to do them as fast as, as you would like. We have other, um, um, you know, ex experiments, uh, you know, that we need the mice for as, as well. So we certainly can, you know, work these experiments in and we can try to kind of expand what we're doing. But, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to sort of work through a schedule and, and I can't give you an exact time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's a big next step. I think maybe you and I and Methan and uh, others, can, yeah, I'm sorry about that, uh, should get together. Uh, we'll get together and, and talk about the uh, next steps and what the throughput is and, and what we can do to help you as well. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how can we help uh, from our end and, and support uh, the work you're doing? Okay, that would be great. Yeah, and then based upon that, I mean, I think uh, I, I agree going down is, is the logical next step, uh, but also we have some interesting compounds. It would be interesting to get some of those other, I mean, I think it's important to get some um, other compounds in there as well, to the extent we can. So right now, yeah. what I'm here so, I, so Eileen, you're going to do histology right now for that hundred mix, right? And then the plan after that was basically, so we won't do all of the other doses. We're thinking of probably doing one other dose, right? Well, we're not going to do that yet, right? We're going to discuss and then decide on next steps, right? Yes, yeah. We're not we're not yeah. making a final action yeah. at this meeting. We're gonna we're yeah. gonna talk about because uh, I think we need to have a, a frank discussion about what your abilities. Are and then we need to definitely prioritize what we yeah. think is is, is right. Uh, the right, right next steps. Mm -hmm. But are the pl uh, are the um, plasma samples uh, been sent to Ahmed for analysis? I think that's also very important. Yeah, I the, was right, right. I was just going to ask that too. Whether you already have data and whether you know that 
um, that the drug is uh, getting in sufficient levels, you know, through through the body and to the brain. It seems like that would be an important thing. Yes, to establish I agree. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we have excellent PK for the compound. So it would be nice to see what kind of exposures you're getting. We're getting nice linearity with dose. So we, we have done PK at 100 mg per kick. So we know what exposure we get from PK. It would be nice to compare what exposure you get. Let's, I think Eileen is saying, let's analyze the samples she has. Yes. Right? So yeah. I, I think I think I think we I agree. I mean, I was I was I was trying to be um, doing uh, minimize my work, but that's okay. I mean, I, I can I can get <laughs> the samples, and I, I was doing try, trying to do them all at the yeah. same time. However, I think it is important to know the concentration for this this experiment. We yeah. we have historical data from single dose. We know how much we get. But it would be nice to see in this model and these animals uh, what was the concentration. And you know, I, as soon as I get them, I, we will do the analysis uh, for both plasma and brain. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you, Alin, you can ship them to us. I'll give you the address again, so so that we, we uh, you can just ship it to us, and we'll do the analysis. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then, so we'll schedule we'll schedule a meeting after this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Alin, I'll coordinate you with you offline for a follow up meeting. And with the, the crew, I, I'm I'm sorry, Eileen. You've uh, made us too excited with such good results. So uh, I think uh, it's, your, it's your own fault for being so successful. Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to do it. It's always good to have good results. Uh, hi everyone. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I just make a can comment? Can I ask a question? No. Uh, just, yeah. Can I ask a question to Eileen? I'm just wondering if um, she's ever looked at palbutyrotene with uh, an op two inhibitor. Like doing the combination study, uh, we we have not in our model. We 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 have not done that. Would, do you think it would be a possibility? Because I know palverotine is in what phase two now. A phase three, actually, starting phase three. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah no, I, it I absolutely would be. You know, I I I think it, you know it's an experiment that we've talked about a lot, but we um, but we haven't done that yet. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I th I think it would require some some thought just to make sure that they're, you know, how how to do the dosing and the coordination and you know whether mm -hmm. there's any reason to think that one might interfere with the other, but um, certainly is a reasonable approach. Okay. There's another question here. Hold on. Two points would be nice, of course, to profile more components in me work, and this experiment it takes uh, quite some time to do. Uh, and I recall that uh, in the past someone mentioned we can kind of mimic this uh, FOP process with uh, the TGF beta signal in which the Is it possible to develop some kind of marker like for one day experiment maybe, and track down? Do PD PD experiment basically? Yeah, yes. Yeah, like, but a cute model, more chronic model, more two weeks two and it could be just. Yeah. I, I, I was having I'm having trouble. Yeah, she's having trouble hearing you. So use the other mic. Use the other mic. You want to slide down here? I recall uh, in the past uh, someone suggested that it would be possible to develop like a, a TGF beta signaling model, like an acute one, and that signaling is very fast and you, you can take a readout like within four hours, like in vivo. Um, um, I don't recall who suggested that, and it probably was either published or one of the collaborators suggested that. Like at rheumatoid arthritis, uh, we used like at Pfizer St. Louis, we used TNF alpha acute model for quick evaluation of, of compounds. Like they challenged that uh, the mice with LPS, that would cause TNF alpha to go up and then apply inhibitor and take a readout four hours later. And we could uh, push through like a lot of inhibitors for evaluation. Maybe we could do 
the same here, like to see how our inhibitors affect TGF beta signaling, like in one day experiment, that would be. So you got that's so you're thinking more of a PD model, Eileen. Yes, I, mean, I, yeah. I don't know what to experience. So just instead of doing the chronic efficacy, uh, there is you? a shorter term PD model that we can look at BMP or TGF beta type signaling to see how well the compound. I'm, I'm, gonna work. I'm not catching the kind of model PD model. I don't know what that is. It's like pharmacodynamic, basically just monitoring BMP signaling. So is there like a short-term experiment that we could do? Just looking at BMP signaling well, in, a, in, in, vivo. in vivo. And then would that be a good enough surrogate to kind of predict efficacy? Um, yes, I mean, you certainly could do immunohistochemistry and look at phosphorylated SMADs. You could do that in your, the brain tissue as well. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, we we have we have done that in uh, looking at uh, heterotopic ossification. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to do that by, uh, say, a Western analysis because it's hard mm -hmm. to compare and to know that you have equivalent tissues that you're grinding. Mm -hmm. You know how how do you how do you normalize to say that you have significant differences, but, um, mm -hmm. but by immunohistochemistry, you could see what's, what's happening and make more, a better evaluation, I think. Okay. Yeah, you were just proposing that as a, high, a potential higher throughput means of selecting compounds, right? Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, you know, as a, a cell-based assay in, in vitro, 